Thank, okay. Thanks, Manishka. Hi, Joe. Uh, David. <laughs> like, like with Cynthia, I have a sort of a memory lane to stroll down uh, <laughs> yep. relating to Joel and EPA. Uh, our first interaction at NASA GIS with EPA mm -hmm. um, was during the 1980s, at which point uh, Joel uh, was working in, at EPA. He was the direct, deputy director of the climate change division, was headed by John Hoffman and Dennis Turpak. And uh, we participated in a number of interactions trying to uh, encourage the US government and others to take climate change seriously. Uh, and um, just as a sort of a brief anecdote, <coughs> at the time EPA first interacted with us, Jim Hansen, of course, was the director at GIS. And Jim was sort of a dyed in the wool NASA scientist which means as a scientist, his job was to provide the data and the analysis and leave policy out of it. Somehow getting involved in policy was um, something scientists really shouldn't do. It was almost sort of something to be ashamed of. And EPA forcefully dragged Jim into the uh, policy debate uh, saying that it's important to get a seat at the table and we need your help in doing it. And uh, so now, obviously, you can see how far Jim has moved in that direction. But it was because EPA with John, Joel, and Dennis that uh, that was the first push for uh, a sort of somebody who considered themselves only a scientist to realize that bigger, bigger issues were involved than just understanding the data. Uh, since then, so that was back in the 1980s when Joel was doing that. In fact, uh, Joel was a co-editor of the uh, report. I think Cynthia might have alluded to it in 1989, the potential effects of global climate change on the United States. So that was 33 years ago when Joel was first involved in trying to get the US to really understand the security risks and climate risks involved. Uh, since then, Joel has been the author, uh, an author on two previous national climate assessments, a chapter lead on the international chapter of the fourth US national climate assessment, a coordinating lead author and lead author on three IPCC change assessments, involved in researching and advising policymakers on the vulnerability and adaptation to climate change, and also advises domestic and international clients on risks from climate change and strategies on adaptation. It's hard to think of a person who's been more involved and sort of is more of an expert on this issue than Joel. Thank you for coming to give the talk, Climate Risks to the US and its Security Interests. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction. I, I do fondly remember going up to GIS you know, above that world famous uh, restaurant uh, <laughs> that you guys occupy. But I've been getting those briefings from, you know, world class scientists like you and Jim and Cynthia. It was, uh, yeah, I, I still remember those. And uh, no, they were just, it was just a, a treat to be there. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay. And uh, get the slideshow on. It's so sorry. Okay, there we go. So let me begin. Before I, I begin my talk, I actually do want to go down a little memory lane myself, and I appreciated um, uh, Cynthia's um, introduction. And um, I fondly remember, so I did start, and, and one of the topics that has come up in these seminars is sort of, gee, what's been the view of climate change, particularly in those, those early days, you know, before it was such a, a central issue? Uh, that, that it's that it's or that what became one of these central issues it's, it's become um, and I do want to offer some thoughts on it in a minute but I do want to also remember I, I did start working on climate change in March of 1987 for Dennis Turpak I appreciate that uh, he hired me and consider myself very fortunate to have come in at that time um, and I did as as David mentioned co-lead the and, and Cynthia's right it was the first as far as I know it was the first national assessment of climate impacts on any country 
Um, uh, and it was initiated by Congress. But we had, I started in March. I found myself a month later in Boulder, Colorado. Now at the time I was living in Washington, DC area. So came out uh, where I live, Boulder, where I am now, where I've been living for quite a while. And we had an organizing meeting for the report. And it was there that I met. And I guess Cynthia's right. We actually met before then, but Cynthia was there. Martin, I believe, was there. Bill Travis, who's uh, on this, uh, this webinar, was there. I think Linda Burns, who's a co-author, who we heard from. I'm pretty sure Steve Schneider also came to the meeting, or at least we ran into him. And so just the, all these, you know, giants in the field we got to meet them all at once it was uh yeah those were some heady days and so what i want to do is i actually want to i'm actually going to offer you a three course meal if you will the uh appetizer is going to be some opening observations about how i've seen our perceptions of climate change evolve over decades the main course is is my lecture which is and I'm going to focus this on climate change and US national interests the lecture also covers so this was this came from the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which was released in 2018. The lecture also covers the main findings of those assessments. I welcome you to read those. I there just isn't time to cover that, and I thought I'd focus on this climate change in U.S. national interest because it's a bit of a different take on vulnerability and adaptation, and hopefully you'll find that interesting. And then, uh, like most meals, if if we're not completely full, if you're not completely full of me and there's time, I'll offer some closing thoughts on you know, vulnerability and adaptation assessment, maybe future directions where it might go. Although I have to say, and I, at Nobuo, that was a fantastic talk. And I, I think we need more of those kind of uh, uh, integrated uh, comprehensive presentations. I thought that was great. Okay, so um, these are my perceptions of the evolution of climate change. And David, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts. I'm sorry, Cynthia isn't here. It'd be interesting to get hers, but it's just how, how things have evolved on roughly a decade by decade time scale. So when I first got involved, you know, we thought of climate change, we knew that Earth's temperature was increasing. We had the global temperature records, but you know, in 1987, it wasn't clear that, that something was going on or what the cause was. And so we tended to think about current climate almost as, as if it was sort of in a quote unquote, you know, stable, relationship or, or a stable situation, not necessarily change. And then we talked about climate change in the future, you know, in the future, we'll need to do this. Uh, we'll be seeing this and that. Well, that changed, and I, I should say here, and it changed, and, and David mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, was the leader of the, the GIS group, uh, Jim Hansen, in 1988, he gave very, I'd say, dramatic and uh, I'd call it earth-shaking testimony before the Senate saying climate change has begun. And that really was what really did shake up the scientific world. Well, eight years later, the IPCC kind of kind of caught up and said, yes, there's a discernible human influence on climate. They weren't saying all the changes were due to the to human causes, but they were saying there was a, a portion that we can clearly see that's anthropogenically driven. Well, things went on from there. So again, I, and I'm using these decades loosely, but we then, and then with regard, because my work is on vulnerability and adaptation, it's like, well, what about impacts? And it soon thereafter became evident that we're seeing impacts of this warming. And I'd say particularly in the, at least initially, it was particularly seen in the physical and biological systems. Now notable here was Camille Parmesan's seminal publication on location of butterflies in California, where she tracked a sort of a, a movement to a higher latitudes. But also, I'll mention, uh, and again, I'm sorry, Cynthia is not on the call, the IPCC in 2001. Now, I was fortunate to be the uh, coordinating lead author on the synthesis chapter, where, among other things, we developed the so-called burning embers figure, of looking at what could be considered dangerous levels of climate change. But And that was uh, new at the time. It's been continued by subsequent IPCC reports. Uh, but also, uh, someone named Cynthia Rosenzweig led a section of that chapter um, looking at observed impacts of climate change. And that was also new. So Cynthia really has been a pioneer in so many areas, you know, in agriculture, I think, in uh, observations, and, and, you know, her lecture a couple weeks ago on urban uh, uh, systems and climate change. But that was, that was new. Um, then I would say our... Uh, appreciation of how the impacts of climate change are being felt, I'd say, got uh, deeper and more sophisticated because I, I'd say roughly in the next decade, again, very loose, that we it was clear that impacts on society 
were being felt. I, to me, for me personally, I thought this was well captured in the third U.S. National Climate Assessment published in 2014, which really was the main message was, hey, this is happening and it's affecting uh, us as well as natural systems, but also the IPCC attribution work, which Cynthia led in the fourth assessment. Um, and Nobu, I do very much remember that plenary. I've been to two of them. They are quite memorable events um, and, and continued in other, other fora as well. So here we are in the 2020s. I think this is the decade where we are beginning to, or maybe are recognizing that not only are we seeing impacts, but they're becoming catastrophic. And Nobuo's uh, talk you know, uh, illustrated that, but we're seeing so many other impacts where we are now attributing them to climate change, either saying they're, they're more severe because of climate change, uh, they're more intense, they're more light, uh, more frequent. But the point is this, is, this has been a dramatic change. And you know, going back, really, it isn't that far back in time, 30, 35 years when I started, I, I for one, didn't think we would see this much this soon. Uh, and I'd welcome thoughts from other uh, old timers like myself, but it's, uh, you know, it's been a pretty dramatic change. And I think a lot of us thought that it would take many decades to, for these impacts to be clearly felt and probably, you know, beyond our lifetimes. So uh, let me move on then to the, the main event, which is, I'm gonna present briefly the summary of this chapter from the, the fourth US National Climate Assessment. This is on the effects of international climate change on US national interests. So let me explain what that is. So. This is based on the fourth NCA. It was published in November 2018. Um, there's some interesting politics associated with that. I'll come back to that later. Um, so the National Climate Assessment um, actually is done every four years. It was required by an act of Congress passed in 1990. Um, and uh, although you can do the math, it hasn't been published every four years the way the act requires, but they've done pretty well on that. But it's typically focused on how climate change affects the United States, and you know, what happens to our coast, to our water supplies, to various regions of the country, much like, as Cynthia noted, we did in the first U.S. national assessment, but it's a, this is a much bigger effort. Until this fourth assessment, they had never looked at this one interesting topic, which is, what about climate change that happens outside U.S. borders, and what does that mean for U.S. national interests? You know, like I'll get into what those are, economic security, those kind of things. So I was honored and asked to be the what's called the lead author in the chapter. And it was I, I like doing new things. So this this had never been done before. So I thought, OK, this is a lot of fun because we can kind of kind of, you know, make this up and organize it as we go along, if you will. And uh, as opposed to following a script that's written for us. So that that was very interesting. And, and I was also fortunate to have an outstanding team of federal and um, I'd say academic and consulting co-authors, people from uh, NOAA, from the State Department, um, from uh, Department of Defense, USAID, uh, Jim Beiser, as example, had been at NOAA and was University of Arizona, uh, some consulting colleagues, and we had the distinguished uh, Dr. Diana Liverman from the University of Arizona as our review editor, who was a real expert in this topic. So with that, we were well served in this. So, um, Introducing these risks, the focus is going to be it's on relative risks of climate change to the U.S. national interests. And by that, I'm talking about climate. We're talking about climate risks. We're focusing mainly on climate change, but we're also considering current and future variability and, and extreme events. And what I'm going to do, what I do, what I'm going to do in this talk and what I did in the lecture is I took what we published, um, but I'm also assessing the relative significance and likelihood of the outcomes. Now, the chapter did not assess the relative significance of, that, uh, of these outcomes. Uh, and so, and significance, um, the way I'm looking at it is how important is it for US interests, not for global, but for US interests. And so keep that in mind. And I'm sure, you know, these are just my judgments. And, and you know, when the talk is over, I'd, I'd welcome people to challenge my judgments. that's fine. Um, likelihood is a judgment of how likely the impacts are to happen. It also considers the confidence in the likelihood. Um, these attributions are sort of relative. They're not sort of absolute. They're relative to each other. High means high relative to the others. Low means low relative to the others. Now, again, I'll repeat, the judgments on significance of the risks are mine alone. Um, and, uh, but I do draw into chapters judgments on likelihood of the outcomes 
So the uh, what we assessed was how climate change, again, outside U.S. borders, so around the world, how it would affect the U.S. economy and trade, military assets and preparedness, development assistance, humanitarian interventions, then two, I think, um, each very interesting topics and, and, and somewhat um, uh, uh, controversial, I'd say, conflict, that is uh, how, you know, conflict outside U.S. borders. We do have enough, we have a lot of conflict inside U.S. borders, but that's for another lecture. Uh, but outside U.S. borders and how that could affect U.S. security. Uh, migration, and I focus there on the potential migration, uh, again, of people outside the U.S. to the United States. And then finally, we looked at transboundary issues, basically along the U.S. borders, again, with Canada and Mexico. And these would be such issues as water resources, human health, I'd also add in fisheries. So let's dive in and see what we found. Now on economics and trade, now the US economy is currently about 22 trillion a year, something in that range. Uh, exports, 7.5% of the economy value of, import, we import more than we export. Total value of trade is something around three to 4 trillion. Impacts of climate change are estimated to be at least hundreds of billions of dollars per year in the US. Um, that, that was in a separate part of the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Interestingly, the impacts on trade have not been estimated. Now, by the way, here's another place where I can wave a flag for Cynthia. Cynthia, along with Martin and Gunter Fischer at IASA in the early 1990s, uh, worked on a study of global agriculture. And that considered not just how climate change would affect crop yields around the world, but also what would happen to agricultural production and trade. And they ran sort of what's called a partial equilibrium model that basically showed, you know, production shifting more to high latitude areas away from low latitude areas, which, you know, could be very risky for much of the world's population. But that was quite a, that was published in Nature, it was quite, quite an influential study. But there has not, to my knowledge, been a comprehensive study about overall impacts of climate change on global trade. And gee, it's kind of an important topic. So it's interesting that that, that from what my knowledge has not been assessed, I did come across a, a German study looking at impacts on for Germany, but not for the US or globally. Um, now these impacts on the US economics and trade are going to result from changes in relative competitiveness. And a lot of that just being, you know, shifts in average temperature and precipitation and where climate sensitive activities may shift like agriculture being a prominent example, but other, other activities as well. Also extreme events and other consequences, they're gonna affect supply and trade routes. So, and I don't know if you can see this figure because my screen is being blocked by my picture, unfortunately, but if you can see this uh, figure on the, on the right, we talk about uh, extreme events and their impact. So a couple of examples, um, the two, in 2011, there was, there was massive drought and there were floods in Russia, Ukraine, Australia. These led to a spike, well, in US, but also global wheat prices. In fact, some people think this might've helped trigger the Arab Spring, um, but it, it, so it clearly had global consequences. Also, and if you can see this figure on the right, the point is here that there were floods in Thailand that affected uh, supplies of inputs to US businesses, car production. I mean, we have this global market of uh, you know, as a, a result of globalization, and you know, and and very and supplies, things being built and shipped all over the world, and if you have a disruption in one location, it can affect uh, you know economic activity literally halfway across the world. So th there is a lot of sensitivity to what goes on in terms of just weather and climate around the world. Now, the judgments on consequences. My judgment is the consequence are low to medium. The reason is that. Um, I think it's uh, that there will be effects. I think it's just a question of the scale and will it have a major effect on the US economy? I, I don't, again, but I would you know, welcome challenges on that, but it, it seemed that relative to the other impacts, it's, it's, it, it would it may be important, but not as significant as some of the other ones, but I'm, I, we're highly confident in the chapter and I agree with that, that US trade will be affected by climate change. What's the direction of the change? In other words, is, is the U.S. going to benefit from this or be harmed? That's harder to say uh, because the mid-latitude country and a lot of uncertainties about exactly what, you know, what happens in many other locations and how people respond. So a little hard to say what the net effect, but we were, the, we in the chapter were quite confident that U.S. trade would be affected, will be affected by climate change uh, and therefore that would have effects on the U.S. economy. Never mind, of course, the global economy too.
Now, in terms of military assistance and preparedness, we're talking about military assets such as bases and equipment, and they're at risk from sea level rise, flooding, fire, and heat. Now, these, by the way, these assets are already at risk from these, and the military is already working and has been for some time working on you know, harden these assets. Um, some cases, I think even talking about possibly long-term relocation, which is interesting. So the U.S.'s military is looking at transformation and they're doing a lot of work on in terms of planning for the future. So clearly preparedness and deployment of U.S. troops and assets could be at risk from extreme events such as heat waves, floods, fire, coastal storms, spread of disease, uh, many uh, many of these things. And the, the picture on the right was is... Uh, actually it was in the US, this is a uh, hurricane, uh, Michael, that uh, really hammered Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. Um, and uh, that was just one example of extreme events causing some very devastating impacts. Now, my judgment on the consequence, well, let me just say the likelihood, likelihood is very high. I mean, this is for, it's already happening. So, it, 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 you know, virtually certain there will be, there will be effects on military assets and preparedness and they will, they will grow in the future. The consequences, my judgment is medium. There will be significant app, uh, impacts on some assets and readiness. I don't know whether it's going to simultaneously affect many facilities and preparedness across the military at the same time, such that it would have a major, say, debilitating, uh, degrading effect on US preparedness. But again, I think that's uh, open to judgment and I'd welcome comments on that. Okay, development assistance. So the US government, like many other donor countries and multilateral organizations uh, like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, they provide development assistance to help countries uh, essentially help them develop towards self-reliance. And to the extent that climate and particularly climate change reduces, de reduces developments expected to partially or completely offset US assistance. In other words, this is well known that in many developing countries, you get a major disaster and their, their income may be growing year to year, disaster hits, and they're actually losing income. They're set back for years. So it is, it's, it's, these disasters can, are, are quite a big deal. Um, and so, you know, the extent that uh, long-term changes such as crop yields, loss of land, sea level rise, damage to infrastructure, change in disease patterns, all these could, could, uh, you know, uh, um, offset some of the effects of U.S. development, if not all of it. Also, of course, extreme events, as I talked about a moment ago, and I have a big effect. So um, there is, but there are some key uncertainties, even though, you know, it's expected to have a net negative impact, that is climate change on development assistance. There are some severe, there are key uncertainties, including, you know, how severe, how much will the climate change, how will it play out, but also baseline development, you know, how will developing economies grow? You know, I, one example, in 20 years, Bangladesh's uh, poverty rate was knocked down by more than half. In fact, I was in Bangladesh in 1998, and I was just there a few years ago in 2018. It's dramatically different because of development. So that has a big effect. And there's also adaptations, you know, to what extent will there be more heat or drought resistant crops or other changes? Uh, the kind of adaptations that Nobu was talking about, of course, that's <laughs> that's a developed country, not a developing country. But there is, you know, adaptations were made, being made around the world. So my take is it's difficult to draw firm conclusions on the extent to which climate change can or will offset development. The consequences, I again here too, I'd say medium could have significant impact on development. Now this is in terms of U.S. development assistance. Okay, I'm talking. Let me make sure this is a narrow focus, not on developing a, a country economies. It's, it's the U.S. assistance. It could have a significant impact on development assistance, um, you know, it, it, because more if we were trying to keep an, you know, the same level of development, we, more would be required. Whether we spend that money or not is another matter. Um, but I'd say one of my uh, the findings here is that development assistance is an important but not a dominant part of U.S national security interests. I mean, it is, it's, we should were a more dominant part, but unfortunately it's less than say some of the military and other issues. It's highly likely though, that there will be some adverse impacts on development assistance um, here too, in terms of the, the certainty of the magnitude of impact. I think that's clearly less certain, or I'd say that's less certain. Um, it's difficult to determine if climate change will somewhat offset or largely offset the effects of assistance uh, but a significant impact is quite possible. 
Okay, so let me look now at humanitarian, related to that are humanitarian interventions. Now these are often, these are what's typically done to following natural disasters. Um, and in fact, there's a picture on the right here of US military assistance following Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines where you know, we moved in ships and troops to try to help out with uh, disaster response and recovery. Um, you know, with increased intensity of extreme events, it's entirely plausible there will be more humanitarian disasters in developing countries and therefore more of a demand for, for humanitarian interventions by countries such as the United States. So this would, uh, I think, result in an use of increased use of U.S. military to provide relief and dedication of U.S. resources. Now, that is important partly for the military because it takes away from their main mission, which is security. They're diverting ships and personnel to dealing with disasters. Uh, does not appear to me that increased hum humanitarian interventions would have a major impact on U.S. national security interests. My sense is it would have some impact, but I think it would require additional resources. And again, that is a diversion from the main reason that we have military assets, which is protection of security. I'd say the likelihood here is, is medium high. Maybe I'd shift it maybe more to high. Um, you know, there's a high likelihood of increased intensity of extreme events. The consequences depend to some degree on baseline conditions, on you know, how, what, how other nations react, how we react. There are a lot of factors at play here to sort of, uh, you know, that I think make this somewhat uncertain in terms of how this all might play out. Okay, let me now turn to the, um, one of the more interesting issues we dealt with. And, and I'd say one of the, probably the most, um, uh, contentious issue in terms of, I'd say, intellectually contentious, which is conflict. And the question here is, the issue is the relationship of climate change and conflict. It's the source of much debate. And I see two sides on this. And I think this is a debate that I would say there's not a consensus across the community, but I'd welcome thoughts. So on the one side, I think there are those who see conflict clearly increasing with climate change, if, if you will, almost a deterministic relationship. So they, the proponents would cite Darfur and Syria as examples of where conflicts were caused or exacerbated by climate change. Um, and again, the, I think a key thing here, there, the relationship is thought to be deterministic. There are in the literature studies which go so far as estimating increase in number of battle deaths in Africa by 2030 as a result of climate change, modeling studies. On the other side, and I'm going to put myself in that camp, are those who see a more nuanced and less deterministic relationship between climate change and conflict. I don't think it's, it's not completely random, but it's a little more nuanced. Now, our chapter in the NCA concluded that while climate change can exacerbate conflict, quote, the direct linkages, linkages between climate-related stress and conflict are unclear, but climate variability has been shown to affect conflict through intermediate processes, including resource competition, commodity price shocks, and food insecurity. So our take was that, yeah, climate change could make the causes of conflict worse, and that in itself could... Uh, could be problematic. So we didn't expect conflict to decrease because of climate change. We thought it's possible to go up. Now, the consequences here are potentially very significant. If climate change increases conflict, you know, the question is then, and, and particularly if it's warfare or major disruption or, or, or civil unrest, you know, does that draw in U.S. forces? I mean, might we actually be involved, uh, you know, in, in wars or, or large uh, commitments of U.S forces, that's clearly quite significant. The likelihood is very, I think, very difficult to determine. In fact, when we did the assessment, we were asked to come up with likelihood statements. And I remember sitting on a bus on I mean, way to a, maybe an NCA meeting, and it just occurred to me, it said, you know, you have to have probabilities and some sense of determinism to be able to attach a likelihood statement. And my take was, we don't we can't say how likely this is um, because it's, there, there's so many things going on. And, and particularly with conflict, you have, you know, it goes through human behavior and institutions. And it's very hard to say what, how all these things will change and how people react to individual situations. So while climate change can increase conditions that contribute to conflict, the likelihood of, uh, of conflicts actually being triggered, I think remains uncertain. Now, I just want to point to a, a, a more recent study. It actually came out after we published our work in 2018, 
And this is Mock, this is Katie Mock, who many of you remember was the head of the, the technical support unit for work group two for the fifth of the assessment of the IPCC. I think she's brilliant. She's now at University of Miami. And she led a study that's uh, called Climate as a Risk Factor for Armed Conflict, published in 2019. It was an expert elicitation. And it concluded, this is right from the abstract, these experts agree that climate has affected organizing conflict within, now I have to move this, I'm sorry. I'm trying to move my uh, thing so I can read this. Within countries, however, other drivers such as low socioeconomic development and low capabilities of the state are judged to be substantially more influential. And the mechanisms of climate conflict, conflict linkages remain a key uncertainty. And I would say, and I would add in, nonetheless, <laughs> Uh, so that's not the word they use. Intensifying climate change is estimated to increase future risks of conflicts. In other words, yes, climate change could, you know, increase the pressures for conflict, but it's it, it's something. There's a lot of uncertainty. So it's my read on that is it's not a deterministic relationship between climate and conflict. All right, moving on to migration. This was not a major. Um, focus for us. We actually, we, we wrote in the chapter, we wrote very briefly in response to some comments about it. But you know, the, again, this is also a very important issue. Um, and we've already seen after extreme events, the number of migrants coming to the US going up. A good example was Hurricane Mitch, where we had tens of thousands of migrants from Nicaragua and Honduras, were given, and they were given temporary protection status. Uh, it's a complex topic. It seems reasonable that climate change is, and again, I, I use a likelihood phrase here, it's a could increase migration, um, but there are a lot of uncertainties. You know, uh, how many people would migrate? Where are they gonna come from? Where would they go? And, and specifically in the case of this talk, how likely is it they come to the US? When would this happen? So I think it's difficult to identify the magnitude of risk. The consequences range from low to high. And I think that largely depends on how big the actual effects are. Very, very few migrants may not be that big a deal. If it's a lot of migrants, it could be very big. Uh, and then there are questions of, you know, who's the president? What are they? <laughs> what's their policy? We've seen quite significant differences in recent administrations. And can they readily be absorbed? But, you know, migration we've seen has tremendous uh, domestic implications for politics. That oftentimes you get a lot of migration. You see this in Europe and the United States. It can trigger reactions among among the right wing. So it, it's very the, the consequences are potentially very high. I think in general there's a lot of uncertainty about this, but it is reasonable to expect some increase in migration. It's difficult to make any predictions on numbers, origin, determination, determination of migrants over the rest of the century. There are some published estimates. I would treat those very cautiously. Okay, I think it's very difficult to migrate to model this complex topic. Okay, the last thing we addressed was transboundary issues. And again, this was more about what might happen across our borders, particularly with the US borders with Canada and Mexico and such issues as, you know, what happens in terms of uh, water rivers that flow across the borders, fisheries, but even movement of air. Um, you know, we have air pollution from fires. We've had cases where there were fires in British Columbia and the, the smoke actually came into the U.S. and made its way all the way from northwest, uh, southwestern Canada, western U.S. and all the way to eastern U.S. And, and human health, not just from fires, but disease, and those kind of things. Human health, therefore, I think might be the most serious issue. You know, air pollution is turning out to be a, an impact of climate change that many of us uh, in terms of smoke from fires, many of us didn't focus on. I think it's one of the most significant impacts of climate change in general, consequences for human health and air pollution in particular, but also disease um, it may be very important. Now, <laughs> we wrote this chapter before COVID, so we concluded that strong institutions are in place to address many of these issues. <laughs> that may be, but as we saw in COVID with a million deaths in the United States, these as strong as these institutions may be, the actual implementation is another matter. Um, so we concluded that the public health system should be able to contain such risks. I think if we were going to back and revisit that now, we would significantly uh, 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 water that down. Um, consequences, judgment, low to medium importance, and in general, they could be managed. But again, there's that question of some you know, major uh, think, uh, disease outbreak or something maybe that could be driven by climate change. 
Uh, but these also, but there, there could be a lot of significant, there are a lot of significant issues. For example, the U.S. has to, by treaty, has to supply a certain amount of water to Mexico through the Colorado River. That's getting to be challenging uh, as we're in the midst of a mega drought in the Southwest and the Colorado River flow is decreasing. Movement of fisheries has, you know, in certain can in exacerbate tensions between countries. Um, there are other issues as well. Um, you know, I think potential impact security seems limited and manageable to a strong degree, but there's high confidence that these resources, these cross-border resources are going to be affected by climate change. So this, you know, this, there, there will be increasing challenges, how significant they are. My judgment is for the most part, probably manageable, but, you know, keep an eye on it. Okay. So in summary, um, you know, the risks to U.S. interests are complex and they vary based on the potential consequences and uh, uh, and likely, it's interesting if you look, and these are my ju the judgments in terms of the relative consequence, again, which are my judgment in the middle column, and then the likelihood, which mainly come from the chapter. It's interesting, the highest potential consequence, I'd say, are conf conflict and migration, but these are also, interestingly, I would argue, the most, most uncertain. Um, others, though, there are quite high likelihoods and my judgment was the, the, the significance for U.S. security interests, again, narrowly for that, are more limited. But again, we could, we could discuss those things. So um, now, final thought on the, this was what happened. So the NCA report was published the day after Thanksgiving in 2018. Now, the reason that was was because some people in the Trump administration thought, oh, nobody's going to pay attention because they're all recovering from their big Thanksgiving meal. Well, it turned out it got a lot of media attention, partly because there was no other news that weekend. Um, and it even spilled into the following week. The president immediately disavowed the report. I think he put out a tweet, something like, don't believe any of this or whatever. Um, it's difficult to say how the report was used or is being used, but it was widely cited. It is interesting, the administration dropped development of a framework for a sustained climate assessment, but New York State picked that up, and I was actually aptly led by our colleague from uh, from the volume, uh, Richard Moss. Now, the fifth national climate assessment is underway. It's under the capable leadership of Allison Kremens, um, and it's due to be published next year. So we'll see. And they are going to. Uh, there is a chapter on international on how climate change would affect U.S. international interests. I'm not involved in that chapter, and I'm looking forward to seeing and maybe commenting on the drafts, uh, which probably would be sometime uh, later this year or, or early next year. Okay, so let me actually stop. Do I have time for a couple more for the dessert or should I, uh, should we stop, Jen and uh, Manishka? Um, so we would think you're wrapping up in about a minute or two. So if you want to maybe just uh, put in um, a little okay. nugget that, that we can maybe yeah. pick up during one of the discussions. All right, let me, let me go. I can talk fast as people know me. So let me just say that I'd say a couple of thoughts on vulnerability assessment. I think a lot of cases, what we see, people oftentimes want to see what's the worst that can happen and let's play up the biggest thing. I think we need to be careful about that. And David mentioned this in, in a lecture at the beginning of the series that RCP 8.5, I think, for example, has always been unlikely. But recent trends, I think, make it appear even, even less likely to happen. So I think it'd be careful. This is a figure that you can look at later, but showed what we thought was going to happen, that we were going to get warming to four degrees. But many of the policies that have adopted should hold us down to somewhere in the range of three. IPCC concluded 3.2. You know, will those be implemented? Okay, that's a fair question, but it doesn't seem they're on a directory to four, maybe four point RCP 4.5. Now I'm switching metrics here rather than degrees. I'm talking about the uh, radiative forcing, but maybe 4.5 is the most likely scenario. Maybe six is a more is a higher end scenario. I would also advise though, what do observations tell us about system sensitivities? And I think Nobu's talk is an excellent example of this. Let's not just looking at these projections of the future, but think about what are we already seeing? But then I think it's also important. Then you can say, okay, and then what, what might, where might things go in the future? I think changes in climate variability, and again, Nobu has picked that up, are very important. And, and we need to be not just looking at changes in average conditions, but to the extent we can, and it is harder to factor it in, but think about not just, and not just changes in extremes, but circulation patterns, uh, modes of variability from ENSO all the way to uh, multi-decadal uh, 
uh, drivers such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, and my final thought is just when you interpret and present results, please be humble. <laughs> please note what we've learned, but also what we've not learned, and don't oversell things. There's, uh, there's, there's, you know, we're we're making progress. Uh, for those of your researchers, your research will contribute, but a little bit of humility can go a long way. So thanks for giving me uh, a little extra time, and I'll be happy to respond to comments. Thank you, Joel. That was. Very interesting and also really great to get uh, your advice at the end there. I, I totally agree with you. Um, looking forward to diving a little deeper in the Q&A. So over to you, Jen, for the Q&A. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, well, I think I'll start off uh, with a question. Um, so throughout your presentation, uh, you mentioned uncertainty a lot. So I'm wondering moving forward, knowing these uncertainties, how do we manage them? And what are the strategies for addressing this uncertainty? That's a great question, Jen. I'd say in a lot of ways, I think these, these topics need more study. And I think part of it is to understand you know, what consequences may be and what decisions may, may need to be made. Um, and, um, and I would, uh, you know, also say, and don't, don't make sweeping assumptions. Oh, we'll handle that. Or, or, or this, this institution will work fine. You know, maybe think through, well, what if things don't work out the way we, uh, we assume? Um, but I think that, but I'd say I'd start with, and this is something because we have a lot of researchers on the call, you know, think about, I mean, one thing I might've added to my advice is think about the kind of decisions we're making over the next 10, 20 years where adaptation may matter. And that was one thing that was fun with this chapter was just taking you know, we usually look at so I call the big five impacts, uh, coastal resources, adaptation, water, human health and ecosystems. And there are others we look at too, other systems. But, you know, think of this more of, well, what does it mean for people making decisions about managing resources or dealing with other problems like security interests? And then come at it that way and think about what, what might it mean, but also then, right, what decisions need to be made? And, and so I, and so I, I, you know, it's a great question and I think it, my answer is cursory, but at least begin with, let's, let's start to understand the, the um, magnitude and extent of the risk better than we do. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a bunch of questions in the chat. So we'll start with uh, Kirsten Paff. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think climate change could cause supply chain shocks similar to those caused by COVID? If yes, couldn't that indicate a far more substantial impact on the American economy, skyrocketing prices, inflation, et cetera? Okay, so I, I don't think so. I may be wrong because COVID, you know, I mean, started in China and then just rapidly went around the world. So within, started what, in December or so, 2019, and by March, it had reached all the way around the world and, and countries just started shutting down almost all at the same time. And so you just had this rapid spread. I don't know if we'd have that kind of impact of climate change that quickly. Now, climate change, what happens is it, 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 it happens in so many ways and over time, the cumulative effect could be very significant, but the question is, does it happen all at once like that or, or the consequences of climate change? I don't see that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a different problem than COVID in that regard. So that's my take, but, but it could, you know, individually and over different points in time, yeah, there could be disruptions and impacts and, and, and the question is on how of disruption in one area, you know, how well do the other areas that are still functioning, can they, can they carry on, if you will, and make up for those disruptions while the, the area that's hit until it recovers. Great. Okay. So from Robert Chen, uh, have there been mm -hmm. a Robert. Have there been assessments about whether significant climate impacts on allies or enemies would have significant impacts on U.S. security? Also, do you think the different intelligence agencies within the U.S. have similar viewpoints or major differences in their assessments? Boy, those are both great questions. I'm not, I'm not aware in the future that there may be, and they may well be classified in terms of those assessments that are out there. Uh, hopefully they, have, they are being done. Um, uh, because this is, you know, again, the consequences of this are very important. This may be one of those, even if it's a low probability, a low probability, high consequence. And I'm sorry, the second question was, can you repeat the second part of the question? The second question uh, says, do you think different intelligence agencies 
within the U.S. have similar viewpoints? Or was that? Okay. Sorry. Okay. That yeah, I don't have enough of a class. I, my security clearance isn't high enough to know. Um, so I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, the the a lot of the mil U.S. military sees climate change as a major issue, and particularly, I think, with regard to conflict. I personally think they're being a little too deterministic and 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 uh, on that. But I, but nonetheless, you know, they that is their job. It's not my job, and so they're they take this very seriously. Not just in terms of the assets they, that that and that. I think there's little argument that yeah, they need to be thinking about how to either harden their assets or move them or whatever, get, you know, protect troops and equipment. Um, the conflict one, they are looking at very much. And, and um, I know many senior members of the military have for years said, yeah, this is a real, this is a real concern. Certainly deserves giving the consequences, certainly deserves keeping an eye on it, right? And watching very carefully. Okay. All right. And then from Anonymous, uh, should NATO provide <laughs> great greater funding for food and water system security strategy in your view? Oh, that's a great question. Possibly. You know, it's also occurred to me that we need to think about disaster response in developing countries, how that can be strengthened. And I, you know, and I don't know what, you know, the, oftentimes it is the country's militaries that are brought in and, you know, do we, should we be working more uh, to enhance the capability of military or police in, in not just for their you know their uh, training for war that kind of thing but uh, but for for disaster response uh, but that's a good question about NATO um, and I know they've looked at climate change and they may well be looking at this I'm not I'm not familiar with exactly what they're doing so um, I guess the I guess uh, bottom line is quite possibly they should be looking at it and I'm not sure what they're up to yeah. okay and then I see Leonard has. Uh, his hand raised, and then I'll pass it off to David uh, to begin the discussion portion. Hey, Joel, thanks for a good presentation. Um, you, you know, Joel, um, I was thinking about impacts external to countries that have, that have profound impacts elsewhere as you introduce this topic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating, and perhaps a subject that is worth taking up once again. Um, you recall the IPCC SAR of 2001, but I go back before that, I go back as far as the regional impacts of climate change in 1998. And I think you were also involved in that. And mm -hmm. Memura um, was also involved. Um, and I remember, for example, that a number of chapters in the regional impacts actually showed and implied that some of the projected changes would, could possibly have security implications for other countries. I know you're mm -hmm. focusing on the US, but the US was clearly one of them for which these mm -hmm. implications had significance. Um, I'm just wondering whether if you ever thought of going back to this work again, and, and I suggest that if you did, <laughs> you might want to take a look, a retrospective look at some of these chapters. For example, while it was not always explicitly stated, there were a number of references to what are now styled as transboundary impacts. They weren't called that then necessary. But for example, things like pests and diseases mm -hmm. and the impact of exotic invasives. And these have impacts on agriculture and human yep. health security. So I'm just wondering whether you think there might be anything there worth looking at. Oh, I, I think it's a great question. Leonard and hi. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's an interesting. It, it would be interesting a lot of ways to go back and look at what we thought was going to happen uh, and what's actually happened. Because, you know, many cases, there are surprises. I mean, there's something, you know, I don't, I, we knew fires would go up. I don't think we knew fires would go up as much as they, as quickly as they have hurricane, but, you know, or tropical cyclone behaviors change. But that's an interesting question in terms of disease and, and pests and how it, how it might, might may grade and what it might mean for, um, you know, relations among countries, uh, you know, movement of people, security issues. Uh, but it, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to go back. It might be great work for somebody, in, uh, you know, in graduate school to, to kind of interested in a little bit. At this point, we can, I guess we can say it's history of science, right, David? It's been around long enough. Maybe we can call it that and going and seeing what was, you know, what were the early days like? What were people focusing on? What were they, what did they project? What did they get right? What did they miss? And, and you know, so I, that's a great question, Leonard. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so uh, the discussion section. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, I'm hold on. Um, sorry. I'll start it off uh, with two comments, one for, about Naboo's talk and then about Joel's. Uh, for Naboo's talk, I was struck by how responsive and seemingly unified the, the government's response to climate change is in comparison to what's happening in the US, possibly because the impacts in Japan being surrounded by water are more obvious than what's happening in the US. And also possibly because as Nabu said, there has always been a greater sensitivity and importance of nature in the society than, than there is in the US. And with respect to Joel's talk, uh, especially the last comments he had um, about being humble, for one thing, and also about uh, the uh, question of utilizing higher forcing levels, like the RSP 8.5. I think there is a, a use for the 8.5 forcing, because even though we don't believe that will happen, what we've seen already, as Joel mentioned, is that in the forcings that are likely to happen, we already see that things are much worse than those forcings projected. Mm -hmm. So if one assumes automatically that whatever forcing we use, things are gonna be worse than that and happen quickly, maybe we're better off using higher forcings than will really happen because that may bring us closer to what will actually happen. Anyway, these are both discussion topics. Uh, please weigh in. Go ahead, Noble. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I, <clears throat> I tried to uh, introduce the, uh, some aspect about the uh, uh, Jap uh, Japanese activities for climate change adaptation. Thank you very much for your comment. And, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, if uh, the current Japanese uh, uh, activities uh, seem very unified and uh, uh, controlled by the central government, it is... Uh, uh, you know, uh, partly it is partly due to the uh, uh, long tradition of the natural disaster prevention in Japan. You know, uh, central government has and the Japanese society has a long history to pay effort to protect Japanese society against the natural disasters, both using the natural system and the uh, uh, man-made system like. Uh, uh, Riba Dike and the coastal uh, <coughs> uh, dike uh, uh, system like that. So uh, I think that the, uh, uh, you know, even in the uh, central government, uh, still we have uh, some conflict against the uh, uh, new policy of this climate change adaptation and the traditional policy of uh, disaster risk management, you know. Uh, the people who are dealing with the uh, uh, disaster management, uh, they feel that the uh, oh, newcomer, new enemy coming into our area <laughs> uh, based on the uh, climate change adaptation. But yeah, uh, in fact, now the Japanese for uh, you know disaster risk management a very important part of the uh, 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 adaptation. So you know how to you know uh, promote the uh, mutual understanding of the uh, old system and the uh, uh, new issues uh, <clears throat> like uh, climate change adaptation. It's a, a big challenge for the Japanese society and the Japanese government. But anyway, you know it is very lucky for us because you know we have the long tradition uh, to combat against the natural disaster uh, before. Uh, the global warming come to the uh, such big okay. issue. So that is the uh, one uh, explana explanation uh, uh, to your observation. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'll say, I think that's a, it's a great question, David, and I'm gonna, with all respect, but I mean, I'm gonna disagree with you because I think, so vulnerability in the old definition, you know, is a function of exposure and sensitivity. So exposure is how much the climate change as well as then what systems are exposed to that change, you know, low lying areas being exposed to sea level rise, for example. And so, but it's also sensitivity. You get a certain amount of change and then how does the system respond? Uh, 
I think the problem is that what we found in many systems is that we don't have the sensitivity. We haven't had the sensitivity correct. And I think fire is a prominent example. And Bill Travis is still on the, 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 the call. I mean, he's a co-author on a study that showed, for example, that you know, the, the amount of acreage burned in the Western US has gone up fivefold from 1980 to 2000 to 2000 to 2020. I mean, a dramatic, none of us projected that. So we, we underestimated the sensitivity. You could get at that by saying, well, let's just assume a lot more climate change. But if you're grossly underestimating the sensitivity, you probably wouldn't even get close to what fire behavior, how it would change by just, you know, jacking up the RC, you know, the RCP you use. The other problem is you, you might be overstating other risks. Um, and, you know, we see that media loves it. But, you know, the Guardian always says, oh, my God, this, this and that disaster is going to happen. And then I go, well, what did the study assume? Well, RCP 8.5. Well, what if they had assumed something lower? what would have happened. I mean, I suspect the, the magnitude of the impacts would be lower. I still think at the end of the day, you kind of want to get it right as much as you can. And I would put the emphasis on better understanding sensitivity. That's why I think looking at, you know, we now have unambiguous, what, let's say 50 years of warming, at least since about mid seventies or more, you know, what are we already seeing from that? What, what, what has happened? How much warming is that? What effects is that? What surprises have there been? And maybe that, and then what did we predict? And maybe we need to go back and look at some of these things and say, gee, we really, we really missed that one. Uh, in some cases, we may have overestimated impacts. I'm, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where we have, but maybe we have. But I think certainly in a lot of cases, we've underestimated consequences. And I would, I, I would put the, uh, the effort into better understanding sensitivity rather than, you know, adopting, uh, you know, outcomes that not are impossible. It's, we could have RCP 8.5, but it, and you yourself said, it's quite unlikely that it's going to happen. So uh, one, one particular example of what we have underestimated is summer heat waves. Yeah. Uh, normally speaking, what we've said is, well, uh, the greatest warming at, at, in the extra tropics is during the winter. Mm -hmm. And that has failed to impress anybody because most people say, well, I would like that, basically. Uh, we didn't understand that the circulation might slow and that mm -hmm. the real intensity of heat waves in summer might be greatly amplified as we've yeah. now seen for the past 20 years. And I think this gets to your point of us being humble, humble not only in estimating impacts, but humble in believing what model output tells us the future is going to be like because surprises or lack of proper interpretation of what's going on. Yeah. I think as climate gets more extreme, that's only gonna get worse. And if I could add, I think an important research objective, I think on the science is better understanding modes of climate variability and, and any relationship they have with climate change. And, and change in circulation patterns is one Yes, these, and, and I tell you, experience right here in Boulder, Colorado, the last few years where we've seen high pressure systems just sit there and cook us, and it's worse to the Southwest. But also, you know, what's going on? We're in the middle of a mega drought in the Southwest, um, the, the kind of thing that happens only every few hundred years. Is that some analysis su has suggested that climate change has made the, the intensity of the drought worse? That's credible. I wonder, is it also made the, uh, you know, has it made the uh, presence of droughts more likely to happen? It's a good, it's a reasonable question, but how well do we understand that? That kind of research would also be very useful if we better understand modes of variability. Maybe we can better project changes in coming years to decades, which would be very useful to uh, natural resource managers. So I think that's a very important area to explore. Uh, you know, you still look at the long-term mean changes, but it's the combination of climate change and variability that really gets us on the ground, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leonard, you had you have your hand up? Yes, David, thanks. Um, let me just go back to your introductory comment about the, um, the forcings, whether the forcings matter and so on. Um, and that sort of resonated with me because, you know, the, 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 what I've been thinking is that really, after a certain critical point, does it really matter what the forcing is? I mean, I, I take an example from here in my region in the Caribbean. Um, the evidence shows that many species of coral, as an example, show decreased rates of calcification well before RCP 4.5. Now, and this is demonstrated both by laboratory, 
as well as field studies, observations. So that's why I agree with Joel. I don't, um, I, I would be cautious about saying, well, for um, RCP 8.5 may or may not eventually. I'm not going to get into that conversation because we really don't know. Um, but I would say that I agree with Joel on the point relating to sensitivity. That's why sensitivity is so critical. Um, so for corals, for example, we don't even have to wait for RCP-6. We know the corals are under considerable stress right now and it's affecting them very badly. And I see the evidence exists. I mean, I'm talking about evidence-based studies. So for me, the issue really is one of sensitivity and tipping points. And I think Joel is onto something very important there. But um, I would still be cautious nonetheless about um, beginning, because I've, I've, I was in a webinar recently, Joel. I didn't participate, I just was listening. And, and I heard one participant make the comment that, well, the, S I, the IPCC is sort of um, suggesting that we can ignore 8.5. But I'm not sure I read that in the six assessment anywhere. The IPCC never said that. So I'd be cautious about when the, the sort of signals that we send out publicly on these matters, because the reality is we don't know. But just that one example from the Caribbean worries me a little in terms of, um, and, and hence your, um, your comment about being humble and, and so on. <laughs> I think we take it hard as well. Back to you, Manishka. Thank you, David, for moderating that really interesting um, discussion. And um, thank you to our wonderful speakers today. Um, we uh, have now dived into uh, the regional um, and uh, country examples and they, they've been really fascinating. So uh, thank you, uh, Nobuo and Joel. And um, David, actually, I would like to give it over to you for a, for a few seconds uh, to say a few words about um, uh, you're the series editor, and it would be great for you to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the series. So over to you again briefly, David. Thanks, Manishka. Yes. So as you probably know, this is the second book in uh, the series, Our Warming Planet Lectures in Climate Change. The first book was on uh, climate uh, dynamics, the dynamics of climate change, and was more sort of associated with what you might call working group one from IPCC. This is more working group two. Uh, there is a third book in the series that will be coming out in October on clouds and radiation. And that will be, uh, that will be associated with Bill Rossow, who for many years has done a lot of work in that area. All three of these books, as was mentioned earlier, contain not only short chapters on the topics, but PowerPoint slides that are available for people to utilize in classrooms, in presentations to general audiences, or just for their own education. Uh, so in that sense, it's quite different from the normal sort of dry textbook. And uh, we also know that this webinar series, uh, which went on for the first uh, chapters in the first book and in this book, and presumably will go on for the third one as well, are the result of a lot of effort done by Cynthia Rosenzweig, who, as you can see, has her finger, fingertips, fingerprints over every aspect of this whole project. And, and, and once again, we thank Cynthia. Thanks, Nita. Uh, thanks, Manishka. Thank you so much, David. Um, and also thank you, Jen, for moderating the Q&A sessions. Uh, we'll just wrap up. Um, now, the webinar recordings are available and they are mostly up to date. So if you missed any, uh, we really encourage you to check them out. And uh, we also have, uh, this is bi-weekly, so we have some um, um, more uh, lectures coming up. Jen, over. Yes. So um, on July 6th, we have uh, another great regional example um, focusing on biodiversity hotspots, a very fascinating um, case study from South Africa. We might have a second speaker that day as well, so we will send out the announcement soon. And then uh, we have a few more coming up. And as you can see from the right side of this slide, we've completed a lot and those are available um, 
for um, for you to watch. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, once again, uh, this is the book and you can uh, get 30% off by using that discount code on top. Um, you know, when we started off this webinar series um, and of course the objective of the book too is to reach students, teachers, professionals and all interested people across the world. So as we saw from the poll, there are people uh, joining us from across the world. We also have uh, people representing different sectors joining. Um, and we are hoping that this would um, be of use, uh, especially in regions with limited resources. Uh, we hope that these resources will uh, help advance climate change education across the world. So thank you everyone once again for your participation. Many thanks uh, to our speakers, to David and Jen and Cynthia as well. Uh, and hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night, Noble. Get some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.